And oh, thank God, I've, I prayed about this service. And you know what? It was so hard for me to come up with a topic tonight. So we are just going to cut loose. And we are absolutely just going to try to mind the Lord today. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel. And we'll start in chapter 15. And when we look at this portion of Scripture in 2 Samuel, this is dealing with David's wicked, rebellious son, Absalom. Anybody know anything about Absalom? And you're about to learn a little bit about him. Now the Bible tells us of King David, the Bible says he is a man after God's own heart. Now when we look at Absalom, he is completely the opposite. Now you all mark your Bibles right there. And I want to read you a scripture here in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12. And I've read them here before and I'll read them again today. But it's important if we're ever to have that revival within our very hearts, we are going to have to make sure that we are after the heart of our Father. And it's going to come by no other way, no other reasoning, no other understanding but that given to us in the holy word of God. And it's only going to be by the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. It's coming by no other way. You cannot produce it of yourself. It is impossible. And in Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 15, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Though he said I will five times right there, God says to him, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And when we begin to read of Absalom, we begin a few chapters prior to this. And this story tells us of two brothers, they're half-brothers. There's Absalom and there is Amnon. And Amnon has a sister named Tamar. Or Absalom has a sister named Tamar. And Amnon falls sickly in love with Tamar, his own half-sister. And as you read, you see wicked things come forth from wicked people, like what we see in a wicked world, which we live in today. And Amnon, in all of his sickness, lusts after his own half-sister and decides he wants to rape her. He does exactly that. And from that day forward, Absalom's wrath is kindled against him and he's just waiting for the opportune moment to strike him dead. So here Absalom, in all of his vengeance, years pass. And how many knows that a grudge can last a very long time? And I wonder in this house tonight, how many people would be operating under the very spirit of Absalom rather than the spirit of David, which is after God's own heart. If you are quick to hold to bitterness, if you're quick to hold to unforgiveness, let me tell you that you are working and operating under the spirit of Satan himself. I don't care what that family member did to you. I don't care how wrong you have felt right here within the church. It doesn't 
matter how many things have been done against you, there is never a good reason, there is never a good cause to hold bitterness and resentment and animosity, anger and hatred against your very family, your brothers and sisters in Christ, your co-workers, your schoolmates, no matter who it is. If you professing to be a Christian allow bitterness to dwell within your heart against one person, no matter how grievous the sin is that they have done against you, you do not operate after the spirit of Christ. You walk after the flesh. You're carnal in your doings and you better believe if you think it's just in that one portion and place of your life, that seed sits there and that seed grows just like any other seed ever would. Because you're going to find ways, rather the enemy might in your own mind, you will find ways to water that animosity so it grows into hatred. And the Bible says if you hate your brother, the Bible says without a cause, you have committed spiritual murder. And you might say with your own arms crossed and your chest puffed out. I've got all the right to be upset with this person. I've got every right to hold the problem that I've got in my heart against them for the rest of my life until they come and apologize to me and I see fruits of repentance about them. I'll never forgive them. You operate under the spirit of the devil himself. Amen. Amen. And I don't have a clue while I'm on that. I can shut that because I'm not using it. And I thank God today that he's dealing with hearts out there because this is such a true, sad, but it, it's such a truth today within the church of the living God. People say, I'll never forgive. I never will. But you watch. You watch. Just what happens here in the heart of Amnon still happens in the church today because that spirit looks to grip your very heart and cause you to act after him. Just as David was a man after God's own heart, as you continue to read on, we see that Absalom is very crafty in all of his doings. Who does that sound like, church? The Bible tells us when the devil appeared to Eve, he came to her in the form of a serpent which was more subtle than any other beast of the field. He's very crafty in his works, and if you try following after your own heart... You better believe, as Jeremiah said at the great prophet of God, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Surely not you as you're led by the deceit of your own heart. You cannot know the depths of sin that it will drag you down into. And Absalom waits. He's crafty in his doings. And then Absalom comes before his father, the king, David, and he says... Let all your sons gather together. I, I've fattened up my sheep. I've sheared them. And I'm going to create a feast. And make sure. Oh, make sure Amnon's there. Oh, some people just have to wait till someone else is around so that they can spew off their words against another one. So that you can bring things up to try to prod a response out of somebody else that will not provoke your brother or sister or anybody else around you towards love and towards good works, but rather you're poking and prodding somebody else towards wrath, leading them in a downward spiral themselves. And David thought to himself, something's fishy here, but he just didn't have it down and he allowed it to happen. And then Absalom, when the time came, he killed his brother. Over a period of years went past. Don't you dare let bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness abide within your heart. You pluck that thing up by the roots the moment that you feel it. I know everything that's in this world prompts you to hold on to this grudge. I know that everything that somebody has done against you can seem impossible to get out of your mind. You might not have to forget it to forgive them, but let me tell you that when you do, peace can begin to come back into your soul. And I thank God for that. It's often been said that forgiveness is more for you than what it is for somebody else. Because you might be the only person that this problem is vexing the way that it is. It might never cross their mind, but you're suffering and you're drowning and you're breaking beneath the very weight of it. 
And I thank God today that he's delivered me from this. But we've got to look throughout the Bible to see what it is and how it is that we must escape these things. On the day that God delivered Peter from Herod as he was going to kill him, the Bible says, Peter said, I've been delivered from the expectation of the Jews. When you can get past all of the people pleasing and just worry about one thing and that is pleasing God Almighty and not worrying about what anybody else so thinks of you. Don't worry about comparing yourself, stacking yourselves up against somebody else that you have to preach like somebody else, that you have to teach like somebody else, that you have to sing like somebody else because God's got a work to do in your life and you're the only one that can do the job in which he's called you to do the way that he desires you to do it. The Bible says those comparing themselves one with another is not wise, the thing isn't. It's not. So we see in this very, very serious scenario as Absalom kills his brother, he flees. He's gone from the kingdom but the heart of David, though years pass, is still fixed upon his lost son. Who does that sound like? I don't care how grievously somebody has sinned against me. I don't care how bad they have ran my name through the dirt. I do not want any sin committed against me to be left against the charge of another. I would rather have enough spirit of God about me to say the same as Jesus said as he suffered upon the cross, as he stretched out his arms about ready to give up the ghost and finish, accomplish the mission that he was set out to do to save the souls of you and I. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And I've had many talk my name down. I've had many try to drag it through the dirt. I simply do not care anymore. It might have hurt me in the moment. It might have damaged my confidence that I had in that person because you better believe it'll happen right in the church house. But we've got to be mature enough to forgive them, to let go of all of these things because it's doing nothing more than wrapping thorns around us, cares of this life that's going to strangle the fruitfulness that God desires us to grow throughout this walk with we, which we have with Him. And I thank God today that He's able to secure those that are tempted. The Bible says in Hebrews, it says that we serve a living God, one who is after the priestly order of Melchizedek. And the Bible says that he knows exactly what it's like to be tempted with every temptation that we could ever face. Yet he did it all graciously, flawlessly, without sin. And because he knows what it's like to suffer temptation and to refuse it, he is also so able to succor those that are tempted. It means he's able to help you to where you don't have to blab your mouth or run it because the Bible says in the book of James, how many of you ever got caught up in a flare of emotions and you just let your words spew? The Bible says be swift to hear and slow to speak for the wrath of God Man worketh not the righteousness of God. Amen. But we see so many falling in to this wile of the devil, never learning from it, never correcting themselves because they're too driven with their own self-righteous form of judgment. I cannot let this person get away with what they have done to me. I cannot let this person have the final word. I will have the final say. This is after the nature of the devil himself. And Absalom, if there was any, anybody that had a reason to do something atrocious as what he did to slay another man. There's people that sit in the church that would dare to say, I'd do the same thing if somebody raped my sister, even if it was my half-brother. 
You better think again. You'd better think again. I know it's an atrocious sin. Sin is sin, my friends. And it'll all end you up in the same place. But when you go and try to take judgment into your own hands, you bypass God Almighty himself thinking that you can take all of this authority and say so in your hands. Who's it sound? I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. The devil himself. And I told you to look at 2 Samuel 15. I'm finally there. It says, And it came to pass after this that Absalom pre prepared him chariots. Absalom, let me backtrack. No notes. Bad brain. Absalom was gone away from the kingdom through all the wrongs and the evil in which he did. David's heart, a heart after God's own, still longed after Absalom. Just like God's heart still does for us. Like God's heart does for you. Even when you atrociously wrong those in which you ought to love. God's heart still longs for you. Just as David's heart longed for his son, you are the creation of God, the apple of his eye. And he longs for you. It breaks his heart when you sin atrociously against him. No matter how great or how little of a sin you think it is, it is all, it is all sin in God's eyes. It shall land you in the same place, the lake of fire, except you repent. I promise you this. I don't care what anybody else preaches. I don't care what anybody else teaches. The Bible is very clear on sin. And actually, sin is such a serious, serious offense that God would go as far to give them in the Old Testament all of these ordinances of sacrifice. Blood must be spilled for the price of sin. Jesus' blood was spilled for the price of our sins. And we trample upon the blood of Christ. We take light His sacrifice and we count His blood that He shed for us. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, an unholy thing. How much sore a punishment do you think we are deserving of when we do such things as this, thinking we can get away freely? We won't. God sees it all. But yet His heart longs for us as David's did for Absalom. And finally, David brings Absalom back home to Jerusalem, back into the kingdom. Some of you all, your hearts, your bleeding hearts, as much as they do, you're willing to compromise with sin to bring it back into your house, and it's going to be nothing more than a hurt and a damage to you. I've seen it happen time and time again. I've seen it happen in relationships among youth and those that, are, those that are well up in age that should know better, seasoned saints, if you will, people that know better, know that you should not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, knowing that it will absolutely pull you down. You cannot pull them up. It's only by the Spirit of God that this thing is done. They will always pull you down because that's what that unequal yoke does. When you think that you can take fire in your bosom and not be burned, I promise you the gospel truth that you are in for a rude awakening. And we've got so many people doing just that. And though David's heart longed for him, brought him back into the kingdom, it says here, we're back to 15. Verse 2, Absalom's back in the kingdom. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. See, Absalom left a very crafty lie into all of those that would hear him. It's the patting on of the back for those that need to be rebuked. It's the patting on of the back of those that need to be exhorted. 
They need to be brought into the light of the true doctrine of God given us in this holy word. And we see it happen in the days that we live in today. Churches falling away by the millions out there. Setting on some soft serve gospel that everything's going to make it. And I promise you the word of God says narrow is that way that leads to everlasting life. But broad is the, the road and many there be that walk up on it that lead to destruction. And it's getting increasingly smaller day by day as many men and women of God are willing to compromise that gospel truth so they can pat somebody on the back and make them feel good like God will receive them in their sin that they never have to repent of when I promise you the blood will be required at your hand one day. I see the sword coming. It's been here for many years. It's already come through the gate. It's right here in our county. It's wanting to seep through the doors of this church and it's looking to corrupt. It's looking to lead astray those that are looking for truth but are lost in their sin so that they can pat them on the back and make them feel good and walk out of church all bubbly. Let me tell you what the church needs a good dose of today is good Holy Ghost sent repentance from God Almighty so that we could get our sins under check under the blood of Christ because I believe that God will not only take a stony heart, break it, and put a heart of flesh in it, but I believe also that He'll put His Spirit as He told the prophet Ezekiel. He'll place his spirit within you and calls you to keep his commandments so that he can be our God that we may be his people so that when we do sin as the apostle John said little children I would that you sin not but if you do you have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous and if you confess your sin then he is faithful he is just to forgive us of all unrighteousness that we've ever committed in our lives I'm thanking God for that today but let me tell you we live in such a day and age that we are falling away from the truth of the gospel when what we need is what the Apostle Paul preached. He said, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We cannot make people feel all right. When they're lost in their sin, we must let them know. We must blow that gospel trumpet. Get this word out into the land because we are right on the cusp, on the verge, if we're not already there, of that Amos 8 famine that is to sweep over the land where there will be no hearing of the word of God. I believe we already see precursors in it because nobody wants to hear the truth. You bring up the word repentance and people want to turn off. You bring up the word Holy Ghost, holiness. You bring up the word sanctity, sanctification. You bring up the word chastity. And people turn off because they don't want to live holy. They don't want to live righteous. They don't want anything that God offers. And you'd better believe there's someone out there to will, offer them what they do. So desire. Just like Absalom did right here. Churches all over compromising on the word of God. And Absalom, driven by his own self-righteous sense of judgment, says, I'll do you justice. All the devil will come along and say, it's all right. They told you it's okay to go out and drink. Better think again. Jesus drank wine, didn't he? Let me tell you exactly what the devil likes to do. Jesus drank wine. They drank it at the Last Supper. Hey, Paul told Timothy, have a little wine for thy stomach's sake. They leave out the because of your infirmity part. They leave out the very part that they had that in those days. They leave out, they leave out the history of it that Timothy was stationed in Ephesus, a, a, sea, a seafaring land where somehow the, the underground water had been polluted and it caused intestinal and digestional issues and how wine 
was a very good medicinal thing that they had in those days. And he said, you take a little of it. They, they want to belittle the little part of it. And they want to take out the because of thine infirmity part. And they want to take out the fact that we don't live back in whatever time A.D. it was. And like we don't have other options out there that can cure the same thing. They want to act as if it's all okay so that you can justify going out and getting a buzz. Justify going out, taking a few drinks with your friend. They want to pat you on the back. They want to do you justice. Let me tell you, I'm glad I don't get justice for my sins, but I get mercy. Let me tell you that, oh, there it was. Thank you, Lord. I was on something that I forgot, but it came back. It did, and now it's gone again. Ah, there it is. Thank you, Lord. You see, oh well, my goodness. The devil is fighting hard against this, y'all. Pray for me, because I can't get it out. I cannot get this out. Jesus, in the name of the Lord God. I've never had that happen before. Never had that happen before. upon the presence of the Lord to give somebody what they need. God, drive away these spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus right now that hinder your word. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we rebuke these things, God, that hinder so that we can have freedom. Lord God, I pray that you allow me to feed this flock in such a manner that the demons that drive their lives, oh God, right now, Lord, are driven away, God, in the presence of your glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask for this right now, God. Lord, bring back to remembrance that which you have given me. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray, oh God. Amen. Amen. I promise you the devil is fighting so hard against this. Continue. Oh God. The devil does seek to, to lead us all astray. He's doing it. He is doing it. He is working overtime. And I believe we're out there. Nobody wants to hear this word of God right now. But we, I believe, have a heart right here in this place right now to receive this or else the devil would not be fighting this the way in which he is. I know good and well I must be on such a topic right now that the devil sees it fit to fight against. But I promise you today that he's not got no victory. He's not got no victory. No, not at all. Nothing. Nothing at all. Jesus. As Absalom stole the hearts of the people, the devil seeks to steal our hearts today. He sure does. He's done it so much, so frequently, so often. And I pray that right now we can get about the Father's business, wake back up out of this stupor that we are in, and be that light. God, I wish I could remember that. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen today. It don't look like. My apologies for that, but my, my, my. God, bring us back around. Let me bring some redemption back over. Absalom stands in the gates of this people. He says, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that I would do him justice, 
And then the Bible tells us in verse 5 of chapter 15, And it was so that when any man came nigh to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. He's going to solace you in all of your wrongdoings. He's going to make you feel as if you are absolutely right. Thank you, God. Lord, I pray right now, help me through this, oh God, because there are so many that are doing just that today. You must watch out for these doctrines of devils that are abounding in the land today because he took them. If you are willing to give in, to this weak need gospel that these people peddle out there, they will take you. And they'll get such a grip on you that you will never hardly be able to get away from. And there it says in verse 6, in the latter part, Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. As God is shown in the heart of David, Satan is in Absalom, just as it is in much of the church world today. But we see that though Absalom drive forth David out of the kingdom, his own father, he has a rebellious spirit in him to slay his own father and take the kingdom for himself. And I thank God today that he's shown me that the very thing happens in the hearts of men and women. They want to take this kingdom for themselves. My life is my own. I make the call. I make the decision. It's up to me. I don't want any higher authority over me. I'll rule. I'll govern. I'll do justice to my own life. But yet he did not know that God saw every single work in which he did and that he would cast him down to the very pits of hell in which he would Satan himself. And as David wandered off, his heart still longed for his son. As they prepared for war to take the kingdom back, the Bible says that David spoke to those men that were with him. He said, don't do the man any harm. He's my son. I love him and that's the everlasting love that our Father God has for you and I. That he doesn't desire to see one of us perish. But yet we see Absalom's wickedness had already caught the eye of God and he said, I'm not going to let him go. He knew good and well that that heart was set on wickedness against him. And if you sit in this very house right now and your heart is set on unforgiveness, your heart is set on holding bitterness and grudges and animosity towards another, you better be careful that God doesn't set his eye upon you for wrath. I promise he still does it. I promise he does. He is a God that does not change. That means his love is lasting forever. That means his mercy endures forever. He still does, but he's still a God of unspeakable wrath. And as he set his eye upon Absalom to destroy that young man, Joab finds him. As all of the beauty in which he possesses becomes the very thing that slays him, we see that as word comes back to David, is he alive? David, the man after God's own heart, begins to break because it's not his desire that you perish in this thing. And he began to weep. And he said, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, would to God that I would have died for thee. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, would to God I would have died for thee. His heart was set that he wished he could have given his life in place of his so that he could have a chance of repentance somewhere on down the road. And I wonder how much God's heart breaks for his people today, knowing that a loving father was come down from heaven wrapped in the likeness of sinful flesh who knew no sin, Jesus Christ the righteous gave his life for you and I upon that cruel tree of Calvary. And I wonder if he mourns from heaven today. My son, my daughter, don't you know that I did die for you? Not that you can stay locked up, bound in this state that you are so lost in and ate up with right now, but that you could have life and life more abundant 
Oh, my sons, my daughters, don't you know I died for you? And for all of those that acknowledge, unlike Absalom, and I believe unlike you today, no matter whose heart it is that it's dealing with, that he's given you another window, an opportunity to lay the heavy burden of bitterness down at an altar. You say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I'd rather hold it. I know what it's like to hold on for something for way too long. And then it'd be hard to let go. I once thought that I was going to preach to the neighborhood and I brought my speakers out and set them up in the driveway, cranked it up as loud as it would go, and I strummed an E chord. And as I strummed that E chord, I thought I'd play a song in opening and just have me a church service there. But that's not what the Lord wanted. The Lord just had me preach immediately and I held that E chord and I strummed it for probably a good 45 minutes. And by the time I got done, I could not move my hand out of that position because I had held on to it so long. I know how hard it is. If it's hard for me to let go of something that I held for 45 minutes, how hard do you think it would be for you to let go of something that you've held on to for years, for months maybe? Decades, I don't know. But God is in the business of restoring things. God is in the business of restoring relationships. God is in the business of reconciliation. And the Bible tells us that we are ambassadors, you and I are, for Christ Jesus, as if God did beseech you himself by us, be ye reconciled unto God. He's in the business of restoring those things. Just as Christ's blood was what reconciled us or brought us back into good favor, man with God, God has des desired me to be that for you today, an ambassador for Christ, so that you can let go of the bitterness that holds you. You're not holding it now. Make no mistake. It's holding you. And the only way you're ever going to find a way to break the grip that sin has upon your life is given to you abundantly, powerfully through the name and through the blood of Jesus Christ. There's power in confession. There's power in forgiveness. There is still power enough for you to lay this thing down as Jesus said of himself. I say to you today in closing, if they'd come to get a song. He said, I have power to lay down my life and I have the power to take it up again. I tell you today that you do have it under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Today I say, lay it down today. Lay it down and take up. Take up the call of God on your life. Because all of these things that are holding you down, that you're holding on to, the bitterness, the resentment, the hatred is doing nothing more than hindering you from getting closer to God. You have power to lay this thing down today. Get freedom, the freedom that you need to walk right in to that season of revival that I believe is right around the corner for this church. And I thank the Lord for this today. But let's do the work. Let's lay it down. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, for it is your reasonable service, not to be conformed to this world, but to be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You've got power to lay this thing down today and he can change your mind about that very grudge that you hold.